Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the Northern Powerhouse, Will It Still Be a Priority After Lockdown? I would like to start by introducing myself and my fellow presenters. My name is Alex Watson. I'm a director in the employment team, and I advise medium and large UK and European employers, and with a particular focus on hospitality, retail and manufacture, and I specialize in compliance and business planning. Today, we have an expert panel made up of partners and senior lawyers specializing across a range of expertise, including corporate transactions, uh, venture capital investment, brand development and commercial law, as well as financial regulation, and of course, employment advice. Firstly, we have Tom Ward, and Tom is a partner in our corporate finance team, specializing in venture capital finance and mergers and acquisitions, acting for both companies and investors on equity investments, acquisitions and sales. We also have the ever excellent James Corlett, who is a partner in our commercial group, leading the commercial IP team in our Manchester office. James has over 12 years of experience working with Northwest businesses and advises on strategic projects ranging from licensing, contractual joint ventures to business outsourcing. James regularly advises clients on routes to market, including distribution, agency and franchising arrangements, and high value long term supply and purchasing arrangements, specializing in commercial contracts with particular expertise in the retail industry and advises on multiple intellectual property licenses, brand ambassadorships, and e-commerce agreements. And his varied experience in the retail sector has included advising listed corporates and global fashion retailers and tech startups. And finally, we have Simon Lafferty, who is a financial regulatory and finance lawyer who advises across all sectors of EU and UK financial regulation, and in relation to various types of financial markets and products, including lending, structured products, and derivatives. Before we kick off, for those who are not familiar with Phil Fisher, we are a full service European corporate law firm with 25 offices in 11 countries. Your panel today largely hail from our Manchester office, which is the firm's largest outside of London. We are well known in the Northwest, but we boast a strong client base across the North and the Midlands, as well as working with overseas clients who have interests in the North of the UK. Um, so today's webinar is interactive. So we will be asking the panel questions based on the topics covered as we go, um, and we'll largely be steered by you as well. So if you have any questions, please use the question box in your control panel on the right-hand side of the screen and we will aim to get through as many as possible. If we don't get time to answer all of the questions during the webinar, we will try and follow these up with you individually. Uh, but in summary, in today we'll be covering how Northern businesses can get ahead of the game, what businesses can do to future-proof and protect themselves, some of the various funding arrangements and future fund or business interruption loans which are available to businesses, the measures that businesses can take to implement social distancing, and how to re-engage with staff and attract new talent after furlough. All of our webinar sessions are recorded and available on the Field Fisher website and YouTube channel in case it's so good you have to go back to it. So let's get started. We are still in the early phases of forecasting how regions in the UK will emerge from the lockdown and the impact of COVID on local and national markets. Um, but preliminary research is reporting a particularly heavy impact on the north with a potential fall of up to 12% of economic output over the next five years. However, the government has been quick to reaffirm its commitment to the north, particularly after the red wall crumbled at the 2019 general election. And Boris Johnson has come out to say that the government is still intending to pursue its agenda of uniting and leveling up across the whole of the UK. Um, and perhaps more importantly, that's been repeated by Grant Shapps, the Secretary of State for Transport, uh, and with responsibility for the Northern Powerhouse numerous times over the past month, with assurances that North will play a key role in the nation's economic recovery. Um, and as with any crisis, um, although these are largely difficult circumstances, there will be opportunities. So, James, turning to you first, what do you see northern businesses being able to do to get ahead of the game? Thanks, Alex, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a really good question. I think what's clear 
is that there's been a, a sector by sector response and that's likely to continue. Uh, obviously that's uh, owing to the different rules that are applicable to differing business sectors. And I think this will start to accelerate further as we progress through the crisis. It's highly likely that we'll see some regional divergence there too. Uh, notably, I think as you mentioned, the Northwest is one of the regions most badly hit by the crisis and therefore recovery is likely to be impacted as well. Um, and what we have seen is that wherever you are and whatever sector you're in, um, at least you or your customers or suppliers are likely to have felt some of the impact from the current crisis. And whilst we appear to be past the survival stage, uh, what's becoming more clear is that the uh, getting business out of the lockdown is likely to be more difficult than actually getting into it. It's worth highlighting that um, currently business failures are, are down 30% on a year on year basis. Um, however, it's likely we've probably just not yet seen the fallout from the withdrawal of the government life support, as my uh, colleagues will come to talk about later on in the webinar. Once the unlocking starts to materialise, government support is tapered or, or stopped, I think at that point it's likely that we'll see a number of issues relating to employees, supply chains and customer defaults, which will create winners and losers across multiple sectors. Clearly, now is the time, if you haven't done so already, to, to access relevant financing schemes or seek advice from your uh, local um, enterprise partnerships um, who have been lobbying the Treasury to expand current schemes and achieve more clarity around guidance for business. I'll leave my colleagues to delve into the detail of the financial support packages later on. But the overriding view from government, uh, as Alex mentioned, is that there appears likely to be a degree of investment in the North in order to further the government's levelling up strategy, which in some respects appears to have replaced the Northern Power Hat tagline. Um, whilst we can hope for and expect, based on the recent government pronouncements, that there will be substantial regional investment, particularly in travel and, and broadband infrastructure. This obviously hasn't yet materialised and therefore there's no onus on Northwest business to, to mitigate the impact of the crisis themselves. Whilst obviously we remain cognisant of the potential investments um, in infrastructure, this webinar re is really a focus on practical steps that SMEs can take in, in the wake of COVID-19. Um, I think it's important to, to flag that timing will be an issue for most businesses as we start to see different sectors creak into life months after a big lockdown. Uh, clearly, the longer this goes on, the more critical um, timing of recovery becomes. Now, from our own experience in recent weeks and months um, of, of trade and various contracts, we've drawn some conclusions which we're hoping will, will help you prepare right out the, the lockdown and, and obviously beyond as well. So firstly, if you've not done so already, um, we would suggest reviewing your existing contracts, in particular focusing on the wording of force majeure clauses in these key contracts, paying particular attention to the list of non-exhaustive events, which is often included, and the consequences of triggering a force majeure event, and this obviously vary depending on where you sit in relation to, to that relationship. Um, our advice on this is to seek um, to consider two questions in relation to um, force majeure or some of the provisions. Firstly, what is the event relied upon um, and does it meet the threshold in the applicable, applicable agreement? Um, one thing to be particularly cognizant of at the moment is being vigilant for opportunism from counterparties. It's clear from what we've seen is that the current chaos will be used as, as leverage. Um, so being aware of or in a position to take advantage of that then, then acting quickly and, and being nimble are, are absolutely key at this time. Um, some key points for you to consider more generally is uh, location and the diversity of your supply chain. If upstream suppliers are in locations that are most heavily affected by COVID-19 um, or where there's been complete governmental shutdowns, for example, supply chain disruption is, is obviously more likely. And what we, we are seeing is uh, more localised supply chains uh, kicking into, into play. Um, suppliers will inevitably face disruption to their supply chains and will have time to prepare for delays or failures in supply um, where longer lead times have been agreed. But nevertheless, it's really important to ensure that the continued delivery of goods during that period of lead time um, will not have an impact after um, the restrictions are lifted um, post COVID-19. Um, we generally suggest speaking to key suppliers now 
uh, to understand and consider the impact of, of lead times on changes to stock holding, logistics, warehousing, and distribution strategies. It's important also to consider the extent to which supplies you know, can be replaced with those from another location or, or supplier. Analyzing the logistical issues and cost implications of that is the first step in, in doing so. And also think about whether parts of the supply chain can be uh, assisted virtually using technology or sped up via process or, or, or other improvements. Um, one overriding point to mention here is, is maintaining safety and traceability as well. Clearly where alternative supply chain um, solutions are found, um, it's important that companies make sure these changes are properly documented and risk assessed in order to maintain the transparency and traceability of the supply chain. And this is particularly important where there are products and safety regulations to comply with. As mentioned, uh, there's several opportunities that COVID-19 and its ramifications present both for you and others within the supply chain. Uh, depending on where you sit, it clearly could be on the winning or losing side of this. Um, and proactive uh, steps need to be taken now in order to either end unprofitable supply arrangements or enter new or different relationships with third parties. Um, it's important as well, whilst we're in the midst of the current crisis, we mustn't forget about another significant impact coming our way, potentially in the shape of a no-deal Brexit. It looks increasingly unlikely that the government will seek to extend the transition period, and the hard deadline of the 31st of December will require businesses to readdress and update and implement their no-deal Brexit planning in a dynamic environment. So in terms of future-proofing, um, Supply chains are clearly uh, complex um, and the impact can be unexpected. Um, what we have been seeing uh, a lot of lately and, uh, and, and providing a, a great deal of advice on is uh, future proofing those relationships to ensure that they are profitable and effective as you as you move forward. Um, clearly, the, the this key area to focus on flexibility and scalability, which we've already touched on, communication having clear channels of communication with counterparties, um, particularly where they're seeking relief from performance. Um, also important to bear in mind that uh, variation of, of existing contracts is a potential pitfall or risk um, when having these conversations. So these conversations should be properly documented and ideally routed through um, your internal legal team or, or, or otherwise to your external lawyers. Um, as I've mentioned already, uh, worthwhile auditing your arrangements and seeking to mitigate um, any likely pitfalls that you may come across in, in existing contracts. And then in terms of um, being proactive and, um, and where does the risk sit looking forward to the future, I think it goes without saying that pragmatically speaking, most businesses realise there's little to be gained from pushing the account party into default or insolvency by imposing unreasonable demands and liabilities and sensible middle ground relying on goodwill might be a reasonable approach in the circumstances at least whilst we ride out the next phase of the lockdown. Um, in terms of looking forward to the future um, you might wish to consider including specific triggers for circumstances and events that have become apparent in the past few weeks um, but they might not have been considered previously such as travel bans on employees, ship down exchanges, utilities and money markets and also mandatory quarantine measures. You may, depending on your position, wish to exclude economic downturns, although generally the English courts have taken quite a restrictive view on whether or not the circumstances and event were force majeure based on wording expressly used in the agreement. So in summary, uh, you should think carefully and holistically about your contract. So remember that a contract is very much the formalization of that relationship. And it's necessary in most cases to preserve that relationship insofar as necessary. And any approach to change should be realistic. Also worthwhile bearing in mind that this force majeure clause enables one party to avoid liability to the other, it amounts to an exclusion clause. And as a result, you need to be careful not to breach um, provisions in relation to unfair contract terms. If this isn't done, the business could be exposed for a uh, claim for damages. So in summary, um, we suggest that parties uh, be open um, around their contractual arrangements, um, thinking about the current issues next time you negotiate a contract and openly discuss with your counterparty what would happen in such a scenario. Um, it's worthwhile bearing in mind that in the past 15 years, there's been more um, pandemics um, affecting uh, emerging markets than in the previous 100 years. So the likelihood is that there will be an emerging pattern of 
globalized impacts on um, typically cross-border contracts. Um, but we'll now go right down to affecting uh, northern and northwest businesses. Um, Secondly, we would obviously suggest including uh, force majeure or sophisticated material advert change clauses, um, ensuring that you have cover in your place um, by looking at uh, insurance where relevant, or merely making sure that your supply chains are, are effectively backed up. As part of that, as I've mentioned already, auditing counterparties is going to be a key plank of any strategy, and obviously getting help at the right time as well. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Um, a couple of questions have just come in. Um, firstly, what what can we do when entering into contracts in the future? In because you've talked about force majeure clauses, can we exclude or include references to virus, uh, viruses or government intervention? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, our view on this is generally to consider the position and the relationship with the counterparty. I think. Um, much is going to come down to, to your power of negotiation and the leverage that you have in relation to that uh, that particular counterparty, um, their reasonableness, and also what you're seeking to achieve. Um, there's obviously two ways of going, going about this. Either you can agree fair rights and a balanced set of provisions for each party, and there is some government guidance that's been published on this, but, which is not currently binding, um, but I'm aware that other countries in Europe have uh, sought to commit um, parties to act in the national interest and to um, take a, a fair approach when dealing with issues uh, around contracts uh, under the current circumstances or you're looking to achieve a watertight clause that gives you extra strong protection or leverage um, as i've already mentioned uh, being pragmatic i think most businesses realize that there is often little to be gained from pushing the other party into default or insolvency by opposing unreasonable demands but sensible middle grounds can, can be achieved um and there may be a reasonable approach in in the circumstances um i think in summary um thinking carefully and holistically about the particular contract um in question is is going to be key to deciding whether or not you you, you include or, or or exclude that particular wording it's also going to depend on on, on how you're affected by the contract um clearly a party that, that has very few obligations under an agreement uh, as opposed to a counterparty that, that that's in conduct or, or obligations are likely to be impacted will take a different view Thanks, James. And just to ambush you with one query that's popped up um, for me recently, which is given the the changes in way in which COVID is affecting different countries at the moment, um, one question which has cropped up um, is what is going to happen with additional cross-border tariffs or costs that crop up as part of COVID-19? Is that something that can be protected as part of contractual arrangements? Yeah, certainly. I think... Um... It's important to bear in mind that uh, cross-border cost liability um, will depend on um, the obligations that you're obliged to fulfil under the contract um, or whether you have a right to, to step out of those obligations. Um, generally speaking, cross-border contracts may have some reference to uh, INCA terms, which would dictate um, provisions in a, a cross-border supply uh, arrangement. But generally, they, they can be very specific to the facts of, 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 of the matter. Um, if there aren't any of those provisions, then it's also worth bearing in mind, as I've mentioned, that English law and the courts doesn't really step in to prevent uh, a bad deal or a bad bargain. Um, and the important point here is to uh, think of the consequences um, commercially, practically. Um, is there still a market that is able to service that agreement or customers that are willing to purchase? And I, I guess uh, those are the key questions that will um, guide your strategy on this and if the counterparty is, is is being unreasonable then clearly it might be a case to uh, review the obligations of the agreement uh, perhaps whether or not you um, go for a more nuclear option of the contract such as a right of termination brilliant thank you james um and given our timings, um, I will move on uh, to Tom and Simon now. Um, particularly, this is a query that's popped up for a number of uh, clients that I've been advising in the context of employment and uh, difficulties with furlough, which is about 
what funding options are out there at the moment for businesses based in the north um, and how they can access that funding. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, hi everyone. And, and I, I guess um, you know, there's there's always been a range of financing open to to, to all businesses, um, and the the acute kind of position that most businesses find themselves in now is um, a, a real squeeze on on cash flow, um, and I, I think that's felt you know at all size of businesses um, where clients are just you know withholding payment of invoicing. Um, and, and that, that that's being felt across uh, across the market in all sectors. Um, now, there's some specialist financing support packages that are, are well known and being you know, heavily publicised in the news, um, which we'll, we'll we'll touch upon, in, including the future fund and um, C bills. Um, but it's, it's it's worth mentioning, you know, in the context of you know the Northern powerhouse, and it remains relevant throughout. Kind of the short term and into next year, um, what what you know role the the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund will play? Um, it's it's the cornerstone scheme under the Northern Powerhouse. It's a, a 400 million pound fund, um, which has been funded by both the European Regional Development Fund and and the British Business Bank. Um, and Alex, if you just you just move the slide on. Um, just just to the next one you know this um is is an active fund it's it remains active in 2020 um which is really promising to see um in the, the the way the the fund structured as i'm sure most of people listening will will know is that it, it partners with um the 10 kind of local enterprise partnerships in in the northwest um and operates via kind of uh, specialist fund managers so kind of taking the two um, kind of larger ones you've got um, Maven who operate the um, kind of the northwest um, kind of Manchester based funds and then you've got Mercia who operate kind of the Yorkshire uh, and Humber funds so um, they have remained active if you, if you look at their deal flow um, there's been 61 deals um, in aggregate 14 million since the start of this year um, and, and and some investments coming through you know, uh, across April and May, um, and a, a, a lot of the the funding from the fund has been going in alongside the um, COVID specific kind of, um, C bills uh, loans. So you know, just highlighting two there, um, got Spectrum Cleaning Solutions, um, which uh, is a nice kind of example of a smaller company um a, a cleaning company who took a hundred thousand pound loan half of that came in the form of c c bills half of it came in the form of a uh, microfinance loan from from the investment fund so um you know, the the investment fund is still relevant in this period um that they, they've just released uh or the british business bank um and the the investment fund released a further 106 million to the um, the local fund managers, um, kind of Maven being a recipient of an additional 23 million of that. So the, the, there is capital to deploy, um, and, and and businesses in the northwest um, you know, are able to still access that um, that powerhouse funding. Now, um, I think it remains to be seen a little bit as to how that kind of plays out in the future. I, th I think we're all anticipating that you know, that that the significant cost of all of this COVID-19 support is going to be felt in the short term um, with quite significant austerity measures and budget cuts coming down the road. Um, and to what extent is that going to mean that um, you know, further funding available, whether it be via the, um, you know, the Northern Powers Investment Fund or other kind of um, local LEP kind of funding schemes, um, clearly, there is going to be an impact, and as much as you know the um, you know the, the politicians, uh, you know they are saying the right things at the moment. You know that the North will play a key part in the recovery, and yes, there will still be funding available. Um, you know, no doubt, there will be some um, impact on austerity coming down down the road. Um, so, for, for for SMEs at this time, then you know how how can they kind of ride out the storm? How can they shore up? Um, you know their cash position, what's available to them 
you know, clearly um, speaking to their local LEPs, um, looking on the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund and speaking to the likes of Maven and Mercia, can they be accessing, be it microfinance kind of debt or, or, or are they more suitable to um, taking on some equity finance? You know, that, that, that is available. Um, we're just also going to touch upon some of the COVID specific um, kind of schemes. Um, so actually, if you just jump back a slide, um, that kind of sets out the, um, the key kind of schemes that have been publicized. You've got the Future Fund, um, which is an, a, an equity-based um, kind of scheme where the government will be taking um, or, or providing convertible loans uh, on, on a matched funding basis. Uh, two companies, um, which I'll talk about briefly, and then and hand over to Simon, who can talk through the the C bills schemes and um, the bounce back loan scheme. So, um, if we just move the slides on to, um, so the future fund. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting to kind of see. So it launched yesterday, um, and it's already kind of uh, surpassed the. Um, the funding. So the um, the belief is that on on the first day of um, applications, where the government was you know, willing to underwrite kind of 250 million of funding, they received applications for more than 450 million. So it was it was always anticipated that there would be a bit of a deluge on the first day, and that, and that's clearly happened. So um, it, Rishi Sunak has said that the um, the fund could expand uh, to meet demand. Um, it will certainly need to. Um, so we, we, we wait to see how, how much it will be increased by. Certainly there are companies out there that would not have got in their applications yesterday. It was always on a first come first serve basis. Um, so we, we'll wait to see if other companies can get in on it, but um, it's, it's not suitable for all. Um, and, and looking at the eligibility um, kind of requirements, you know, it's, it's not going to be suitable for all um, kind of Northwest based businesses. Um, I mean, just looking at some of the um, the basic criteria, the business must have raised at least two hundred and fifty thousand pounds in the last five years in the form of equity finance. Um, so companies that have not raised equity finance to date are not going to be able to qualify. Um, the The other thing that kind of marks a lot of kind of companies out um, from being suitable um, it, it's twofold, really. I mean the the future fund is an investor-led scheme, so it must be the investor who makes the application. So companies need to have, obviously, before yesterday, ideally, um, really been speaking with investors if they didn't have an existing investor, you know, who's willing to fund. But um, ensuring that there was a lead investor who would be submitting an application via the portal. Um, and so, if there's not been any natural discussions to date. With investors, it's probably a little, you know, too little, too late. Um, you know, the the fund has really been structured in a way that will support the venture capital funds, you know, applying where they're then deploying that alongside their own capital to support their existing portfolio company. And that was always, you know, thought to be the case, and that that, that really seems to be you know, what's happened here. You know, we we had three applications in kind of yesterday for clients of ours, um, all of which was their existing lead investor um, following on to, to, to support them. Um, so there'll be a, a number of companies who have just kind of not reacted in time um, or, or, or wouldn't have had um, you know, the, the investor on side to, um, to make that application. Um, and, and especially for earlier stage businesses in the region, which are more suited perhaps to speaking with EIS funds um, or high net worth EIS investors, um, where there is a, you know, a, a large s section of the, um, the venture capital kind of industry, which, which is there to support seed stage companies um, you know, as they grow. Um, now the, the future fund is not going to be um, eligible for EIS, so it, it immediately excludes any of um, the investors who would want EIS on their investments. Um, from, from from applying, so um, it, in the absence of companies then either being eligible for the future fund or having been you know, too late in getting the application in, and it remains to be seen if obviously the 
the funding expands, but um, it kind of leads you back to the point of, well, the existing kind of support out there in terms of the Northern Powers Investment Fund, the additional capital that that has to deploy, and other investment networks out there um, of EIS investors and funds who, who perhaps are a bit more suitable, particularly if the businesses are a little bit more earlier stage. Um, so happy to um, obviously kind of answer any any queries on that as they arise at the end, but um, it's going to pass over to to Simon and perhaps some you can talk through the uh, the C bills. Thanks, thanks Tom. Um, so as we've been talking about um, the different sources of government support, it's probably helpful to give you a bit of a lay of the land on what. Um, schemes are available. So there's the Future Fund, obviously, which Tom has been talking about, the C-bills. There's also the Bounce Back Loan Scheme, which we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail, and the C-bill Scheme, which we'll talk a bit about as well. But there are also the Coronavirus Large Business Interruption Loan Scheme and the COVID Corporate Financing Facility. Um, and those are for um, much, much larger companies. So the Coronavirus Large Business Interruption Loan Scheme it, it applies um, for, to companies that have revenues um, of over 45 million, whereas the seed bills and bounce back loan schemes are for businesses and um, below that threshold. In terms of the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme seed bills, um, that is a scheme that is structured. Um, by the government through the British Business Bank, whereby the government um, offers a guarantee of a borrower's um, obligations under loans that are granted by so-called um, accredited lenders. Um, you will have seen there's been a lot of criticism about how quickly the scheme has got off the ground, and they are constantly uh, tweaking and amending the scheme. But as of this morning, there are over 50 accredited uh, lenders on the C-Bill scheme. Um, there are a variety of products, um, so not all accredited lenders will offer all products, but in terms of the product, financial products that are eligible um, under the scheme, they include uh, term loans, business loans and um, revolving credit facilities, overdrafts and asset financing, and businesses can borrow up to Five million um, under the scheme through one of the accredited um, lenders. Um, the the major benefits from um, an ordinary banking loan are that the fees are paid by the government, so the arrangement fee for the financing, and the first 12 months um, of interest are also um, covered. And for businesses that are borrowing less than 250,000 pounds. Uh, no personal guarantee is, is required from uh, directors. In terms of eligibility for the C-Bills um, scheme, um, UK-based, um, turnover can't exceed 45 million, and that's tested on a, on a group basis. Um, the business would have to have a, a viable uh, borrowing proposal, and um, the business um, must not be a business that was quote unquote a business in difficulty as at the 31st of December last year. And what, what's that, what the government takes that to mean is that the business can't have accumulated losses, accumulated losses of more than half of their subscribed um, share capital or indeed have been in any sort of collective insolvency um, proceeding or be subject to a restructuring plan or, or saving other types of, of aid. Um, and then, of course, each accredited lender, which are one you would be applying to, would scrutinise the borrowing proposal. So in terms of steps that, that a business would take in borrowing under C-bills, um, you would speak to the accredited um, lender of choice. So that would be a function of um, who your financing arrangements are with. Uh, but also what financial product you want. So you might think that actually an invoice discounting uh, facility is more appropriate than, for example, an overdraft, and um, you'd want to filter out the accredited lenders that offer those products, and that's all set out on the British Business Bank um, website. Um, it's best to apply online um, because, the, um, for obvious reasons, the, the phone lines are very busy and, and branches are, are generally um, 
not recommended as a, as a route to access the funding. Moving back to the bounce back um, loan scheme, this is this is really aimed at smaller businesses that um, aren't big enough really to access funding under the sea bills scheme. Um, that, as opposed to the five million cap under sea bills, the cap under the bounce back loan scheme is um, twenty five percent of revenue of the business up to fifty thousand. The hard cap is up to fifty thousand pounds. Um, businesses under that scheme can um, borrow between 2,000 and 50,000 um, and it's only one financial product as opposed to the range that's under the sea bill scheme so that's just a six year uh, term loan um, no security required no guarantees are given by by the borrower the government 100% um, back the guarantees that it gives to accredited lenders under the bounce back loan scheme as opposed to the C bill scheme where it guarantees 80%, that's less of a worry for borrowers. And it's a, it's a fixed interest rate of 2.5% as opposed to the um, interest arrangements that are determined by the accredited lenders under the C bill schemes. Uh, just a quick word on um, the large business interruption loan scheme. The CL bills, um, the coronavirus large scheme, is for businesses that have revenues of, of more than 45 million. It, it's largely the same as the C bills um, scheme, but with um, slight amendments. There are fewer, there are fewer um, accredited lenders under that scheme. There's only 10 um, at the moment, but each day the roster is generally being um, expanded. And then the CCFS, the COVID Corporate Financing Facility, um, that is uh, for investment grade companies, so the largest uh, companies, um, some high profile borrowing under that. So for example, EasyJet borrowed 600 million um, through uh, the Bank of England. That's administered by the Bank of England. The Bank of England buys commercial paper from those um, companies. So those were the um, main points that I wanted to mention. Again, happy to take any uh, questions at, at the end. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. So, and Tom, that's very helpful. It leads on to the next question of, well, how do you follow such interesting advice? Um, and the answer to that is, let's deal with the employment aspects. Um, so one of the key factors for businesses across the UK will be how to transition employees back into work and some of the challenges that this will bring. Um, in case anyone's missed it, we Phil Fisher broadcasted a webinar earlier this week on some of the main legal employment issues um, about bringing people back into work, particularly from an ending furlough perspective and a contractual perspective. Um, and that's available on our YouTube channel and on the website. Uh, but one of the main concerns that we are receiving from clients at the moment is the practical aspects of physically returning to work. Uh, for what it's worth, my money is on this being one of the main problem areas for businesses over the next three months as the government's three-step plan to lift lockdown is introduced. Um, and I suspect that the attendees in the webinar would have seen that the government has recently published its new COVID-19 secure guidelines um, which provide practical guidance on how to ensure workplaces are as safe as possible. Importantly though, these are not definitive rules, they are guidelines, and they don't supersede any legal obligations relating to health and safety, uh, employment rights, or any sort of equality issues. So besides avoiding legal risk, these measures are going to be important for businesses um, to get ahead of competitors and in particular from a northern perspective in comparison to some other regions such as London in the southeast where there is anxiety amongst workers about the safety of returning to work and this is almost certainly going to lead to some employees refusing to return if they don't feel safe or if they have vulnerable dependents. Um, so Planning for these changes early, uh, particularly in respect of external risks such as public transport um, and coming into work via trains and packed tubes, um, stand to give businesses an advantage in returning from lockdown. So these guidance notes cover five different sectors, but there are currently five key points to implement where practical. 
And this implementation aspect gives a good degree of scope for creativity within businesses. So thinking about some of the practical aspects and how best to prepare for this, um, what should be planned for now and what should be being introduced now? Well, firstly, COVID-19 risk assessments will be really important. So employers need to consider the risks in the workplace and the way in which that operates. And that can include how that risk can be avoided or at least misgated or managed. So that might be about asking employees or a proportion of workers to work from home, asking employees to work flexible hours. It might be ensuring that social distancing is maintained either with physical distancing or say partitions between workspaces. And it could include restrictions on the use of lifts or one-way travel systems around the workplace. This is where that degree of creativity can come in depending on the individual circumstances. Now, the government has indicated that it expects all employers with over 50 workers to publish the results of their risk assessments on their website. Um, and although this isn't a legal requirement, uh, it, and it could carry some risks such as unwanted press or social media attention, Equally, and being ever the optimist, it could offer an opportunity to demonstrate businesses being ahead of the curve and adopting best practice, which might offer a PR or even commercial opportunities, for example, as part of ethical supply chain requirements. This situation is ever evolving and risk assessments should be continuously reviewed, in particular as part of um, assessment against government guidance. But it will also be important and an often underlooked part of um, devising risk assessments is consultation and involvement with employees in that process. So ideally, employers should consult with employees about the steps that they're taking to help manage the risk of COVID-19, the changes that they're planning to ensure that work is done safely and the practicalities of returning to work. And part of that is actually about taking a role of listening to what the employees are saying and being proactive in addressing any specific concerns that they might have. Um, we've seen an example in the news just today about um, Dyson workers uh, reportedly going on strike in inverted commas uh, because of requests to return to work uh, from the workplace. So this level of engagement is going to be really important about transitioning back to essentially a new normal and getting up to speed and operationally putting uh, businesses ahead of competitors. Um, and as much as anything else, good open employee engagement and consultation is also likely to reduce some of the more sinister legal risks, such as whistleblowing complaints or other uh, alleged detriments as a result of raising health and safety concerns. So once that risk assessment's been finalized or those risk assessments are being finalized, it would be best practice and certainly advisable to share that with employees, ideally as, as early as possible. Next up, it's important to remember that the current guidance is still that people should work from home where possible. Um, and it should only be those who can't work from home and whose workplace um, has not been told to close or once closed workplaces are allowed to reopen, um, that people should be returning to work. But where people are going to be working from home, it's important to remember that all reasonable steps need to be taken by employers to help people work from home. Probably one of the key questions which is um, coming up at the moment for us and which businesses are really starting to plan for is about social distancing and changes to the workplace. So ideally, and the COVID-19 secure guidance indicates that employers should look to take steps to implement social distancing in the workplace where possible. So for example, this might be about redesigning workspaces to maintain two meter distances between people by staggering start times to avoid log jams and bottlenecks, um, creating one-way walkthroughs, operating more entrances and exits, or changing seating layouts, um, including in break rooms or other communal areas. Consideration should also be given to limiting the number of employees in confined spaces away from workstations to observe social distancing such as in lifts or communal areas um, as much as it pains me that i might have to wait to go and make a, a coffee in the tea station area but these are the sort of considerations that can be start be planned for now and communicated to employees and workers who will be returning physically to site now interestingly 
employers don't normally need to assess their employees' methods of traveling to and from work. But in light of the current pandemic, it appears that these obligations are now going to extend to considering how employees travel to and from work. So from a business perspective, that might include limiting the number of individuals who are permitted to travel in a company vehicle at the same time, or even in considering whether a commute on public transport would place a worker at serious or imminent danger. Um, again, thinking back to assessing how your your workers um, come to, to come to their place of work, and in particular whether um, they have to take public transport. So, effective planning is going to be required to make sure that all of these adjustments can be integrated smoothly. Um, for example, putting in place some of these social measures might take some time and might take some planning. Um, for example, particularly operating a, a system where some employees may come back to the office and some may not um, at any particular given time. Um, and it needs to be implemented in a considered manner, ideally as far in advance as possible. So where people can't be two metres apart, employers will also need to think about how we manage transmission risk. What else can we do? So can employers put in place things such as barriers, in shared spaces, creating workplace shift patterns, perhaps of fixed teams operating at the same time to minimise the number of people in contact with one another, uh, or taking steps to ensure that colleagues are facing away from each other. One of the key and fairly obvious uh, points that crop up is in relation to hygiene. So. Workplaces should be cleaned more frequently and ideally paying close attention to high contact objects such as door handles and keyboards. And it links back to thinking about, OK, what steps as part of our risk assessment can we take to minimise some of those risks uh, and some of that contact? And employers should also be providing hand washing facilities or hand sanitizers at ent entry and exit points. This may seem very obvious and anybody who has had to deal with the coronavirus job retention scheme over the past two months will know that it's very important to keep up to date with government guidance which is updated frequently um, and quite regularly. So the guidance is always going to be subject to change and as we move through the pandemic and the government's steps uh, it's going to be very important to keep on top of any of these changes and communicate your compliance as a business with those changes to your employees and potentially to third parties who'll be on site as well. Um, and finally, and it's a point that we in the employment team have raised frequently throughout uh, all of the, the lockdown um, situation is that communication is absolutely key. These are difficult times for businesses and for individuals and we are seeing that the greatest success is with businesses that communicate regularly, clearly and transparently, even when they're notifying workers and employees um, that they don't know what the future holds. But maintaining that regular update keeps assuring employees and makes it very aware of them that their well-being is at the forefront of their employer's mind. particularly for businesses that have temporarily closed or placed workers on furlough. Uh, there may be some difficulties with employee engagement and a smooth transition in steps to return to normality and good comms and planning will be an essential part of reducing some of the legal and operational risk of reopening premises and sites. Clearly, there will be some challenges, forgive me, but the vast majority of people are eager to return to work. In order to facilitate a smooth return to work, there are some practical tips that employers can adopt, uh, which may seem fairly simple. Planning, and although very difficult to forecast conditions for the coming months and year, employers planning ahead and putting in place potential measures and workforce plans will find it much easier to implement these. And the most prepared employers and businesses are likely to see the least risk, but they're also likely to see the most operational uh, ease at bringing people back in and getting back into production. As touched upon earlier, communication is going to be absolutely key. Um, speak to employees about concerns they might have about return to work. Um, keep in regular contact whether these people are going to be continuing to work from home or on site. And in advance of returning to sites and as part of the steps of lifting lockdown, 
consider giving training to employees where possible, whether on social distancing in the workplace, on using any PPE which is brought in or if it's required, or any, any other new working practices. It would also potentially be sensible to create a new formal process so that employees can raise concerns about health and safety in the workplace, ideally separate to the whistleblowing procedure to try and minimise uh, risks of any complaints being seen as being protected disclosures, which increases risk. And in facilitating this return, it may be useful to have a team which is specifically dedicated to planning and phasing a return to work, so who will be responsible for monitoring government guidance and employee concerns where appropriate, and translating that into any changes you may have to put in for your risk assessments or uh, your other factors. Um, equally important is to be creative um, and flexible. These are challenging times for individuals and businesses, and whilst there may be concerns on risk, in our experience, courts and tribunals are likely to be much more sympathetic to employers who have adopted the core principles of seeking to be fair and reasonable with staff, and who have been communicating and explaining their rationale for any business decisions as they go. Um, so there is plenty of scope for employers to tailor their solutions and not be too rigid in their approach. Um, and finally, on, on the ease of returning employees, um, there should be a focus on engagement, making sure that teams feel sufficiently connected to the business and to their colleagues and understand what's happening is key to making sure that they feel engaged. It's also going to be key to make sure that any employees who will remain working from home have the technology that they need and the support for the work that they do, and they have access to all the things that they need to be productive. In the same way, looking back at the flexibility aspect, it's going to be really important, and as we've seen in the press and mentioned the Dyson case today to think about flexibility and not to apply rules too rigidly without a strong business rationale. So employees should be afforded flexibility when working from home so that they can factor in childcare responsibilities. And employees will need to be mindful of other people who are working in their households or the individual circumstances of people who may need to return. For example, people who have um, dependents or family members who are shielding. Um, and just touching on to the final point, and I'm mindful of the timing, um, so hopefully we can pick up any questions at the end. Um, as ever the optimist, it, optimist uh, I thought it would be worth considering how best to consider recruiting new talent at this time as well. So as with commercial opportunities, there will be opportunities for talent acquisition. Um, and again, proactive safeguarding steps taken by businesses may be appealing for candidates who are concerned about job security. Um, as may positive employment practices to demonstrate best practice and highlighting uh, the importance and role of employees within a business. Um, we're seeing and we anticipate that the current uh, crisis is likely to see a revolution of remote working. Um, and we suspect that it's going to have a profound effect um, for the UK's employment practices about how and where employees work for the future. So consider exploring these practices on a longer term basis because this will potentially significantly widen the available talent pool for business to a national market rather than a potentially restricted local pool. And it's also likely to attract potential employees who find this level of flexibility attractive um, and also potentially encourages a more diverse workforce. Um, and finally, it's going to be important to fill the holes left by postponed or cancelled recruitment events by using platforms such as LinkedIn Live to market your business or reaching out to and following up with potential talent directly. I'm mindful of the time, um, but I'm hopefully that in today's summary, we've touched upon the government commitment to the Northern Powerhouse as part of the UK's recovery. And Tom and uh, Simon have very eloquently talked about some of the support packages um, and financial options which are available to businesses at the moment, um, as well as James's advice on some of those commercial arrangements. Um, hopefully there's been some food for thought as well about the practicalities of asking employees to return to work and some of the health and safety aspects that go with that. Finally, if there are any questions now, um, and if anybody else uh, on the panel 
uh, has any questions that have come in whilst I've <laughs> been talking about these issues, please let me know. Um, but if there are any questions, then we will answer those now. Alternatively, if anybody comes up with any questions or this nags away at the back of somebody's mind over the course of the next couple of hours, please feel free to drop us a line. All of our contact details are on the slide. Um, but otherwise, and I'm mindful of eating into people's lunch hours, if not, I'd like to thank everybody for joining today's session. Um, we hope that you found it useful. And if there's anything which has sparked any interest or there are there's anything that leads on from this webinar then please do let us know and we'll be happy to get in touch thanks alex thanks for uh for hosting always happy to host perfect well i think we've picked up most of the questions which were directed to james initially um so at, at this point i think we shall sign off unless anything comes through in the next few seconds um but again, thank you everybody for attending.